Good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Jason's Take On podcast series. It's myself, Jason Noble, based here in sunny, not so sunny today, London, um, and my partner, Jason Whitehead, over in the US. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning for another episode in our customer success focused podcast series. Today, we're really excited to be talking about a, a topic that I think some people are starting to look at and then engage better with, but there's not a lot out there on it right now. And that's the psychology of customer success and even of customers. So when you look at individuals, uh, they're part of organizations, they're actually human beings. How do we know what makes them tick, what their motivations are? So we're going to be diving into that, asking each other a few questions on that. Um, as, as usual, please do follow our the Jason's Take On page on LinkedIn. See a couple of updates from us there on, um, on LinkedIn, also on Twitter. Uh, and we'd love you also to join the LinkedIn group and you can subscribe to our regular weekly newsletter now that we're happy to say we've started doing um, for the website, the jasonstakeon.com. Um, um, I'm, as I said, I'm Jason Noble, based over here in, in London. Uh, been around in the world of customer success for a good while right now, probably in the world of technology for, for upwards of 25 years, which is quite scary. Uh, but most recently, I'm the VP of Global Customer Success for Vinley. Vinley is a startup organization based in Dallas in the U.S. Um, in the world of connected cars. So we deal with large enterprise automotive and mobility companies uh, and customers providing technology solutions for them. And I'm there to help build out their the, the business's customer success function, uh, but also build up our operations here in Europe. So really exciting time to join the business. Uh, but, but also a really great time for the whole industry around customer success to be talking on this. Jason, do you want to give a little intro to yourself before we kick off? Absolutely. Thanks, Jason. Hi, everyone. Uh, Jason Whitehead here based in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, I've been working in customer success with a heavy focus on user adoption and helping organizations really embrace technology, change the way they work, um, and get a better value because of it as a result of using the tools that, that great uh, software companies provide. I've done a variety of consulting and training and other things, and I have a lot of exciting things coming up that we'll be announcing soon. So really uh, love getting these conversations with you, Jason. I think something that you said there, the whole piece about change management comes into this, and we've spoken about it before, Jace, but it's, mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's change, and people don't like change, individuals don't like change, and the psychology plays into that, and there's some questions that we'll ask on this. Yep. One of the key things that we like doing as part of our po podcast is a, a bold challenge question. So asking what you guys can do as listeners, as customer success leaders and professionals, what bold challenge can you do? What bold action can you do that, that can change the way you think and deliver customer success? So the bold challenge question this week or, or this month is what bold action can you take to apply psychological insights to improve how you engage with your customers and your coworkers? So please have a think about that. Do let us know um, in the LinkedIn group, come back with any comments on the podcast. Awesome. Great. So, Jason, let's just kick this off here. Um, why are we talking about this topic and why is this so important? Well, besides you and I think it's an interesting one to talk about, which, <laughs> which it absolutely is. And I think there's been, there's been a lot of, beginning to be kind of a lot of momentum around this. And what, what do we mean when we look at kind of the, the, the supplier, vendor, partner side of things and individuals? And I think you, you've got to look at one of the big things here is motivations. And there are different motivations for suppliers, for vendors, for partners. And, and for individuals. And you've also got your own motivations and your own way of working. So you've got to look at that side of it. There are, as I said in the introduction, there are some big differences between individual motivations and organizational motivations. Right? And when people work together in groups, the group dynamics impact what the, how their motivations work and how they, they work with each other. Um, when you expand that to work with larger groups, with vendors and suppliers, that changes there. So there's a lot of different dynamics that start coming into it there. I think when you, when you look at working with many individuals and ultimately any company is made up of just individuals and every individual is different, everybody has their own approach to work, their own approach to life, their own understanding of what work-life balance is. They've got their own motivations, their own personal circumstances at home. And it's so important to understand that more and how you can be more wary of it and, 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 and help empathize with them on that. Um, I, I think when we deal with customers and stakeholders uh, I, as partners and vendors, everybody's got different priorities. So the guys that are the users of your technology up to the people that are the ultimate stakeholders and doing the sign off, they've got different priorities and different motivations again and, and different incentives. Mm -hmm. You know, the ultimate stakeholder that signed it off, it might be a bonus that they receive 
if this project is successful and drives more value for the organization, you know, ultimately they'll be looking at the profit of the business uh, and the impact of the project on that profit. But as, as individuals within the team, it may be that you've got more granular goals and incentivized around that. So there may be customer related metrics there. So how are the different people incentivized and what, what does it mean for someone to be successful around that? I think you, when we say you've got different types of people, there are different types of engagement models that work with different people. There's the well-known Maya Briggs, um, Myers Briggs personality types. So you've got to look at your, your different customer profiles, your different customer personnel types. Um, and then you've got customer personas. Um, who are the customers you're dealing with? Is there a standard ideal customer persona for that individual person you're dealing with as well as the individual organization? And what does it mean for that individual there? And I think you've also got to help your customer success managers who come in at different levels from graduates to more seasoned professionals that have been in the industry for a long time like yourself and I, Jason, yeah. but how, how can they better engage with different levels of customers and do they, how do they interact differently with executives? What are the different touch points and trigger points that they should look at there? So I think there's a whole variety of different reasons here and each of these in their own right, you could break off into them separate conversations and maybe that's something what we do in the future, but I think it's absolutely worth, a conversation for us to understand this Absolutely. so a question i'm going to kind of throw back to you jason this is fairly a big one so it's it, how can you use customer and individual personas to change how you engage with customers and how, how do you look at different engagement models yeah you know i think there's a lot of things around this and um you know jason we've talked about uh having worked in in the it industry for a while and one of the challenges i was given um by my boss was uh go ahead and prove that you can get people to use the system and get value from it. And I realized I wasn't prepared for that and that I need to learn new skills and how to do that. And I ended up going back and getting another degree in organization development, and human resources, which really addressed all these issues and were tons of classes on uh, personas and how to engage with people differently. Once you understood that, how to deal with conflict and one getting that knowledge is important, but then learning how you can apply it in a work context is, is super important and really, um, opened up a lot of avenues to me that I had never had before in my career. And I think there's a lot of things that you can do around that. And I'll, I'll share some throughout this episode. Um, but I think even one of the, the first ones I like to think about is um, when I think about individual personas and change, and we talk about this is how do you use an understanding of individuals and change and, and personality types to adjust how you interact with your coworkers, with your customers, so that you reach them where they are and that you can really influence their decision, influence their behaviors. And, you know, one of the easiest ways to do that is through asking questions and, and actually listening. And, you know, I think a lot of people, when they go and ask questions, they're really just trying to figure out what are the facts of the situation and how can they identify this really quick piece of information as quickly as possible. And I sort of take a different approach in that. And, and I'd start to think through, you know, why am I asking some of the questions I'm asking? And there's usually one of four reasons. Um, and one of the first ones is, you know, I really am just trying to gather information I don't have and I need to understand a process or considerations or what the needs are, what's going on. Um, but I'm also looking to understand uh, when I ask the same question of multiple people, where are the areas of agreement and disagreement across the organization? Where do different perspectives and different individuals in my customers' organizations think differently or have different perspectives? And what does that say about how I'm going to reach those different people? Or if there's a bigger issue here than the facts, quote unquote, of the situation. So really looking for those agreements is a great way to use questions to understand at a more personal level your customers. Um, but the other thing that I really love about asking good questions and, and, and listening skills is um, when I'm asking questions, I'm trying to learn how the people think and what are their views on the world. And I do this to try and so I learn how to reach them and listening to the answers teaches me how to engage with them in a way that will, be, that will resonate with them. So you know, part of the reason here is really to understand what's gonna work with you. And, you know, I kind of often talk about the example, it's kind of like playing poker. You know, when you play poker, you can play the people or you can play the cards. And, you know, the cards are what they are. They're not going to change. Uh, so your really only way forward is to really think about how am I going to play this person? Um, I love how, that idea. You know, how do I bluff? Do I not bluff? What are the tells? What are my tells? What are their tells? What does that need to look like? Um, so really, by paying attention to people, you learn how to, you can adjust to reach them. So, you know, I, like I say, and you mentioned this with Myers-Briggs, when I understand that some insights that if people are thinking or feeling or if they're more structured and, and serious, more um, uh, open and, and, and see other pants, 
I'm going to position things differently and, and I'll work towards getting the same outcome, but I'll try and present it in a way that will most resonate with them. So I think it's really important that, that people really try to listen to people and ask questions in a way because your customer and your coworkers, they will teach you how to engage with them if you're listening and paying attention. And then, you know, the final reason for using different questions, I think, is also using the questions to try and get people to think differently to start that change process. Um, you know, get them to move past current assumptions, help them find new ways to look at things um, and look for new possibilities. And, and this really breaks down resistance and it opens them up to new approaches and new ways of work, working as a result of that. You know, um, so many people, I, I've sat through so many meetings, I'm sure we all have, where it's like, oh, goody, one more PowerPoint. You know, oh, that extra slide, this is the one that's going to, going to make the difference. And I've yet to have any PowerPoint that has changed my life. But I can, I can recall to this day, like specific conversations when someone asked yeah. me such an insightful question that it really changed my thinking where you need to go. So I would encourage a lot of people to learn how to listen and then learn how to ask questions that will change people's perception and get them thinking. Um, but what are your thoughts? I, I think that, that, that kind of point there about listening and, and asking the right questions is so critical there's a lot a, a, a lot that i've read about and kind of listen to it is make sure you keep asking why mm -hmm. and, and dive into it you know i think is it simon sheck talks about the the five whys where you where you go into you know why do you want this why is it important why is it important to you and and by asking those whys you can keep diving in until you really get to the crux of the problem and it's a really interesting way of doing it, it can be can be an irritating way of questioning. So you've got to phrase it properly where you know it's not mm -hmm. like a little child just saying, why, why, why? <laughs> um, I, and I think interesting, in addition to that, it's important not just to ask why. Um, we, we, we through, through our work now, have all been listening to a series of um, videos, of training videos by the Masterclass organization. There's some really great stuff up there. It's not all work related. The one that I've been listening to recently is by Christopher Voss, who's a, an ex FBI negotiator mm. who's written an awesome book, but but he he talks about this as well. He talks about the listening, the the empathy, the understanding. But he says that when you when you ask why, it triggers a a very deep emotional reaction right. and quite a negative reaction at times. And the reason is, as kids, when we 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 did something, our parents would be, "Why did you do that? Why did you do that?" Now, I don't know how much truth there is in that, but but it's an interesting view of thinking and. His view on it is that ask, ask other questions. So ask questions that include how and what. So mm -hmm. how would this have an impact on you? What did this do? You know, it's a very different line of thought to just why. Um, I, and, and it's very interesting. I think it opens up a whole other area of different discussions you can have with customers um, yeah. and, and, and colleagues. So really, like I say, the, the why is very important, but don't just solely use that and start broadening it. And you can open up some really interesting conversations there. Definitely. And I've, I've been reading his book as well, too, and I'm about halfway through it. And it's, it's fantastic. I really, um, it's given me a lot of insights of how to engage with customers differently. And, and obviously he's negotiating with, with, with some really Hostage bad people. Takers. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant. What is it? Never, never split the difference. The book is high, yeah. highly, highly recommended. Yeah. Excellent. You know, and, and even questions like, you know, what would it look like if it can help shift thinking and, yeah. and get people to do that? Um, and you know, one of the, the, uh, I worked with an executive coach for several years. And one of the things he used to say is, you know, when you find yourself doing something that you're like, what just happened with there? Or when you find customers doing things, you can even just go, how fascinating or interesting, you know, how did you get there? You know, but anyway, um, I, you know, sort of to that end too, how, do, how does motivation fit into all this? You know, how are customers motivated? How are suppliers motivated? What have you, what have you seen there? I, I think it's really interesting. You've also got on top of that, you know, how are your customers motivated? And I said earlier on, you know, if you look at your, You've got your different stakeholders they are going to be motivated differently and, and some some will be motivated by financial reward um, if they succeed but there's also other rewards there may be promotions um, knowledge expansions there may be you know bonuses and pay rises but it isn't just the financial side of it I, and i think really the, there are two elements there's kind of the the carrot motivation you know you're rewarded with something good for doing something uh, but there's also the, the the kind of flip side of that so the stick approach where there are if something bad happens, what's the demotivator around that something bad happens? So you've got to look at the two of those very carefully. Um, I, and I think people, people don't work against their self-interest for very long. And you've got so to be true. very, very, very wary of that. And it's very easy not to take that into consideration. I think you've got to be really aligned with what your customers 
um, incentives and rewards are so get a good understanding of those ask the questions to understand it you know if this goes successful what mm. the, or if this is successful and delivers these outcomes what's the impact for you I, and, it, and it can really open up some very personal insights into what it means for individuals and you find that they are different from individual to individual and potentially different to what the organization goals are um, I think you've also got to be really thoughtful about how you you introduce any changes that you're doing around this. So if, if this is going to introduce an incentive and, and a financial incentive, good or bad for somebody, make sure you know why you're doing it and what you're doing it. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to remember that from a psychological perspective, you're always going to get the behavior that you're rewarding. You're likely to, that's likely what's going to happen. Um, and if people aren't behaving the way that you want them to, have a look into it at a more deep level psychologically. You know, how are they being rewarded? Mm -hmm. um, so what what is it for them i've said already it's not just about the financial rewards and the cash rewards but it might be around how their co-workers interact with them the different levels of respect that they have so, them. you know that that's so true it makes me think of the, the movie office space for those who've ever seen it and you know there's a character in there that goes through a series of hijinks as you would assume but as he's explaining to the the you know efficiency consultants like look i just don't want to be be hassled. That's really my only motivation yeah. here. And I think for so many people, that's the case of, I just don't want to be hassled. You know, what's I, the bare minimum I need to do to get people to leave me alone? There's, 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 you know, that, that is how some people work and you always get in an organization, you get <laughs> your, your leaders or other doing things, but there are some people that just want to just want steady state and that's, yeah. that's okay, but you've got to understand it. It's critical to understand those different types of personality. I think to that point, you know, not everybody wants to be on a fast track career. Not everyone wants mm -hmm. to move into leadership roles. There, there are some people that just want to come in, get the work done and then go home and, and self-actualize outside of work. So for them, that balance between work and, and, life, and personal life is very important. So you've got to understand this. And I think it's really important. The other thing is to look how people's motivations and priorities shift over time. They, they do for sure. everybody as you grow as you grow up just in age in terms of life experience, but work experience, they, they shift completely. I look at myself going from a, you know, a fresh graduate out of university, then to getting married, then to having kids. And even now into this world of lockdown, you kind of motivations and priorities are very, very different. And you, you've got to make sure you adjust for those in all of the situation. You know, what motivates me today in my career is very different to what motivated me in, in the beginning of my life. And as I said, if you've got family responsibilities, it's very, very different. And ultimately, when you're close to retirement, you, you know, think about that as well. Oh, definitely. You know, I, um, I had a couple of examples around this too that I wanted to share that, that I think um, are kind of relevant. So I remember working with one group and we were uh, training up a new internal user success team, user adoption team, but they're basically acting like an internal customer success team within their organization. Um, multi-year project, you know, major CRM. And we went through, and as one of the exercises to create some ahas for them about um, how to collaborate better with the other teams, we put on a flip chart, what is success for the organization? Um, what is success for this department? And what are you rewarded on? What is success for you as an individual? Because there were a lot of people early in their career, or this was a big career switch. And they could sort of see how there were different alignments and different issues and different priorities there. And since this was the, the user adoption team, we then put up a question that said on a, on a flip chart, what is success for the IT department? And that's when they had huge ahas of, they're working towards on time and on budget delivery. They're working towards data. They're working towards getting this out the door as fast as they can and having it work right because that is their mission. That's what they've been incentivized for and rewarded for. And there were huge ahas that there, there's conflict between the role and the, the alignment of, of goals for these organizations. And that since they had to work so closely with the IT team, um, they needed to figure out different ways to identify where is it that the behaviors and the conflict they were experiencing was because of competing incentives and competing rewards. And then how do they escalate that up to a way to get those resolved? And it was really fascinating to just see the ahas that came through when they're like, oh, we have different motivations here. We're working towards different things. We're measured on different things. You know, and I think that's just something that's really huge that, that more organizations need to, to really think through. Like, what is the incentive for the people that I'm struggling with? I think it is, it is so important. It is, it's not just for us as partners, vendors, suppliers. You've also got to look within organizations and then what are they doing around, around these motivation centers? And a lot of organizations spend a lot of time on this mm -hmm. and it's so important to do it. I, I think kind of a question I'd ask back to you, Jason, how do we, how do we go about using the, these kind of psychological principles at a business level? Um, and, and how does this apply then to organizations rather than just individuals? 
Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of things to, to look at in, in that perspective. And, and, you know, one of the things that we talked about the other day was even as simple as how do you apply like Maslow's hierarchy of needs for B2B enterprises? And, and what are some great insights? And you mentioned an article from Bain Capital uh, that you can share a little bit more about in a second. But when I even say, how has this COVID-19 crisis made things change so quickly? And suddenly we've gone from how do we shift from making the most profit and having a great employee experience in the world is wonderful to it's all about safety, my health, my family, you know, and on a massive scale. It's not just one or two people that are struggling with a crisis, but everyone is. And there's this new willingness, I think, on the part of leadership to give people a break and to be understanding um, since they're all going through the same thing, too. And, and I think that's kind of interesting, like, oh, everyone at all levels of the organization are, are dealing with disruption or dealing with a crisis or, or dealing with health and safety issues with very basic needs. And you see how that plays out now in terms of how they're running their organizations and the expectations they have for staff performance, productivity, collaboration. I, I think it's pretty interesting around that. Um, you know, a couple other things too. I, I recently spoken to the CEO and, and uh, there are organizations all working virtual, the office is locked down. And as, as the phase one reopening is starting, he challenged his entire staff to, to really say, are there or what are the business benefits if we're to reopen the office before the end of this year? Is there any justification for it? And he's, and no one could come up with any real compelling reason to do it right away. And he said, you know, we're going to have a slight productivity dip because of the remote work. And, and that's just something that we're dealing with and we're trying to manage through and come up with new ways of collaborating. Um, he's like, but if we started to force people to come into the office too soon, um, any productivity gains that might normally occur from reopening the office would really be eliminated due to fear and anxiety of the staff and, and all of the other issues that would come out of performance issues and staff issues and things like that. It's like, there's no reason to put people through that as well, because there's no business value for that. And, and, and there's no justification for it. And I, I thought that was really interesting. I think that's such an important point it is because you, you are, you know, we've said before, we've seen it that we're all, the majority of us, particularly in technology, are working from home now. And a lot of businesses are beginning to question the need to go back into the office. Now, there will be some businesses that do it and other businesses will decide that actually we can be as productive. But you've got to consider that that fear factor and, and anxiety is critical. And, and how you imagine if you've got staff of hundreds, if not thousands of people, how do you measure that across right. the whole organization it becomes really, really challenging. You, you yeah. mentioned earlier, Jess, about this. Um, kind of value pyramid that Bain Capital have done. It was a really mm -hmm. interesting document that, that I read and I shared with quite a few of my, my colleagues and friends. But it's, it's, we're all familiar with the Maslow hierarchy of needs. But what Bain have done is look at what they've called the B2B elements of the value pyramid. Mm -hmm. um, and they've organized, I think it's around 30 to 40 different types of value that B2B offerings provide customers through a pyramid with five different levels. And you start with the most objective ones at the, the base of this pyramid. So there's a lot of them up to the kind of more subjective and personal ones right at the top. And they, they cover things like um, what they call table stakes. So price, mm -hmm. compliance, ethical standards. Then you've got functional value around economics and the performance. You've then got the ease of doing business value, which is a really interesting one. So things around strategic value, operational value, relationship, access and productivity. And then you start getting down to these more subjective individual ones. So at the individual level, you look at career, you look at personal objectives and values. And ultimately, the really big inspirational ones are around the whole purpose. So what's the vision? What social responsibility do we have? And it's a really, it, it's been around for two years, this, this pyramid, but I hadn't seen it until only this month, no, last month, sorry. Mm -hmm. But it, it really resonates so well because there's a lot of conversations around what value means for businesses. But, but people, I think, quite often are missing that interaction between the individuals and the groups of individuals in the business. And this, this really puts it nicely. We'll, we'll share a link on, on our Twitter and LinkedIn feed. I think it'll be a really good thing to do. Yeah, yeah. And we'll put the link in the description to this episode as well. Yeah, too, cool. A few things. Well, you know, I think you also brought up uh, when we were talking the other day, you know, some of the shifting values and shifting priorities of Zedennials and, and the new generations coming up. And I think that's really important that as organizations reflect, you, you know, you need to values drive behavior um, and in so many ways, and you need to understand that. So, you know, um, you know, I believe when we were talking with, with Chris and Daniel the other day about the, the business catalyst, uh, business catalyst, uh, only when employees are engaged and happy will the customer experience be positive. 
And if your employee experience isn't right, you'll never deliver the customer experience you want. Um, and and, and Chris, is, Chris and Daniel's book, The Customer Catalyst, Not the Business Catalyst, um, uh, they really talk about that. And I think that's so important that as you, you need to understand the values and priorities of, of your staff and of your customers to really be able to work with that. Um, you know, and, and one of the other things I find interesting too, and when we talk about how does this play out um, at a business level, uh, not many people are, are that familiar with it, but here in the U.S., there's also the sort of the rise of what's called a B corporation or a benefits corporation. And we've got a link to Wikipedia about that, um, where basically people have in their corporate charter and legally protected for um, the company to help contribute to society. And it's not 100% profit, mode, which I think is a big change. Um, and I'll just read something from the Wikipedia where it says, in the United States, a, a benefit corporation is a type of for-profit corporate entity and it's authorized by 35 U.S. states in, in the District of Columbia. Uh, that includes a positive impact on society, workers, the community, and the environment, in addition to profit as a legally defined goals of the organization. And in that, the definition of best interest of the corporation is um, specified to include those impacts. And they, they make the distinction here and say it's different from a traditional C corporation uh, law does not specify the, the, the definition of best interest of, a corp, of the corporation. Um, which has really led to the profit motive being used as the main driver for business interest. And I think the, the rise of this as a legal entity and, and trying to work through, you know, legal protections around that really does show that people are, are incorporating values into the business world, incorporating a lot of the motivations into their legally protected status and really what, where they're focusing their organization. And I think that that signifies a huge shift. And I think it's going to continue to pick up momentum both in the U S and eventually abroad as well. It's, it's a massive shift that, and I think it is, it goes down to, Kind of what what do you know about your company values and your company mission mm -hmm. do you as employees buy into that but then also what about your customers values and mission and, right. and do they do their different stakeholders buy into them do you understand what they are and i think what what you're beginning to see is this real shift in value statements and mission statements and whatever you mm -hmm. think about those two kind of kind of entities um but they're beginning to talk more about our customers and the customer's mm. success. It's a really positive change. So I think you are beginning to see big shifts like that organization right. one you've talked about. Yeah. And, and you know, I think if people, if they're inspired enough to create and work for a B corporation, chances are that B corporation is going to reflect in their purchasing activities and who their vendors are looking at what are the values of this vendor? Yep. Do they align with what we want to do? So it's, it's a big thing. Yep. Um, you know, but Jason, you also brought up some points around uh, emotional intelligence and how that, that yeah, factors in. What are your thoughts on that? It, it's a fascinating subject, this. And I think, again, it's something we could, we could, maybe we should do a separate podcast on this. But I think the, the whole idea around emotional intelligence is that it, it's, it, you know, it's about focusing on the most important part of our human minds, i.e. our emotions. Mm -hmm. Now, our emotions help us develop and motivate to take actions under different circumstances. And I was reading something the other day. There's a guy called Daniel Goldman who talks about the five main components of emotional intelligence. And I think they're so relevant to what we do in customer success and what, what I think already a lot of the professionals out there are already doing. But you've got the idea of self-awareness. So that's the ability to recognize and understand your personal mood, emotions, and drives. You've then got self-regulation, which is the ability to control and redirect any disruptive impulses and moods and the propensity to suspend judgment before, to think before acting. And that's so important. You can imagine these challenging conversations with customers when, when the customers, there's a customer health score might be red, there's a real risk of churn. It, it's easy for the conversations to go negative, but you've got to step beyond that. And, and that self-regulation is really key to doing that. Then there's the eternal, internal, not eternal, sorry, internal motivation. <laughs> so this is a passion for work for internal reasons beyond money and status. So why am I doing this? What, what does saying I have a passion for customer success really mean? And, it, and it's, it's a deep question. You know, I think I learned many years ago for me, it's, it's about service. And I think I was brought up in an environment where service was very, very important. And, and, and it stayed with me. And I, I, you know, customer success for me is all about a service mentality. So there is a passion there that, that comes from something far deeper than just money um, and status. There's the fourth one then is empathy. And I think it's something that we, we talk about a lot. We know well in customer success, but it's, it's, it's also, it's the ability to understand the emotional makeup of others, our yep. customers, our colleagues, our friends, our partners, 
and, and to, how to treat them according to their own emotional status and emotional state and emotional reactions. And that's really important. So it's understanding other people. And then you've got social skills. So that's the proficiency in how you manage relationships, both online relationships, kind of your social networks, uh, but also physical relationships and how you then build those networks up and have an ability to find common ground and build rapport. And I think that's so, so, so important. The other thing that I think is key to the whole emotional intelligence side is how you make sure your communications with your customers are, are super, super transparent. There's a great mm -hmm. quote from Forbes that I read the other day saying transparency is the new normal. And it talks about three basic ideas about how it's key to propel authentic information about your products and services into your conversations and communications to avoid any future confusion. Uh, you also don't want to make fake or false commitments that set the set up a customer experience that ultimately is going to break the relationship and break trust. And, mm -hmm. and the third thing is about knowing your brand and by you knowing your brand, it helps you help your customers build and create brand deficiency. So there's a lot of really key things to play on over there. Any, any thoughts you'd have on that? Yeah, a couple, you know, I love that, you know, um, when people talk about CX as the customer experience and which is the common term, but I think it also relates to customer expectations yes. and, you know, and the expectations determine the experience. And when it comes to that transparency of building trust um, and you're setting expectations, which the experience to better follow through and deliver and, and the act of setting those expectations is part of the experience. So I think people really need to, to think about that a lot. Um, but I loved what you said about the emotional intelligence piece. And when I was, um, studying organization development the so much of the program was about teaching you to and the line is always use of self and you know you are yeah. the change agent what does that need to look like and there's a lot of practical exercises and examples around how do you design an intervention in an organization um, where you're coming in and doing an activity doing something else that's going to change perceptions where you understand what's in the room um, and the personalities and the motivations and all of the e EQ information and put the, and apply that in a way where you are helping to shift the organization through, you know, an intervention, a series of interventions, not necessarily deploying a tool. And it was fascinating to actually see how very skilled organizational develop, development professionals can apply those concepts, change how they reflect in the room and be aware of, to your point in the first step of their steps, their own self issues and awareness and what's their story and their baggage versus how do they get in the story of everyone else and the impact that can have on performance. And I think this is so directly relevant to customer success where essentially customer success professionals are trying to get their customers to take actions they wouldn't, wouldn't take on their own or wouldn't know to take on their own and help drive change and adoption and success within your customer's organization. As a CS professional, you're trying to be that catalyst for change, you know, in your customer's organization, you, you need to know how to do this and your cust and you need to know how to get your customers to trust and trust you, like you react well to what you're doing. And sometimes you're going to have to challenge them on some hard stuff. Yep. There's a lot of hard challenges and, and it takes a lot of courageous um, and self-control to do that. So I think those are all such, such important things. And on, on that last point, you've got to be willing to have those conversations, don't you? And it's understanding how you can do it. The emotional impact a negative conversation might have on your customers, on your partners, your colleagues. So it's mm -hmm. being aware of it. I think there is that self-awareness is so important. Yeah. Well, it, you know, like you say about being a service to others, I, I often think in some ways of um, as a customer su success professional, it's almost like if you had someone who was addicted to drinking, drugs, whatever it may be, and it's your job to get them over this addiction. And in many ways, that's what you're doing. You're getting people over the addiction of their current ways of working. Yep. Um, you know, you can get that fancy PowerPoint and just say no commercial and a bumper sticker, like say no to drugs and all the other great stuff. But if someone's already addicted, that's probably not going to have the impact you want you need to think through how you can use yourself and your understanding of their position to meet them where they are and help move them through whatever they need to do. And sometimes yeah. that means you have to have some hard direct conversations. Um, and sometimes it means you get to do a lot of fun things too. Um, but I think that's such a good, good piece of this is why you need to understand this from a psychological standpoint of how do you reach people and move them to a new aha and a new behavior and a new acceptance of, of what's changing. So, I think that, but, that on a, on a kind of a finish note, Jace, I think is a really great way to end this. So guys, Massive thank you for listening. Um, really enjoyed the conversation. I, I think there's so much more that we can break into. We'll, we'll post a couple of these links and things on our, our LinkedIn group. Uh, but, but big thank you to everyone for listening. Don't forget the kind of bold question that we've gone to you guys with. We'd love your feedback on is what bold action can you take to apply psychological insights 
to improve how you engage with your customers and also your customers. So please do um, let us know that. Uh, but big, big thank you from me, Jason Noble. Great. Thank you for me, Jason Whitehead. This has been wonderful and look forward to you joining us next time.